Uh, so welcome everyone. Today what I'm going to do is a tutorial for Solidity. But just before I get started, I think it's worth talking about what is a smart contract. And actually, before I get started as well, I think we should give a round of applause to everyone for the merge. You know, we finally merged away proof of work. <laughs> GG everyone, GG. Finally happy for that. It's been too long coming. Uh, so anyway, let's get started. You know, what is a smart contract? So the name originally came from a blog by Nick Zasbo. And it's a bit of a boring, boring description of it. You know, it says it's a computerized transaction protocol that executes the terms of a smart contract. And I don't think it's really intuitive. Like, it doesn't give you a good mental model of what a smart contract is about. So I typically use this little picture. Uh, it's a picture of a cute little robot. And the best way to think of a smart contract is a trusted third party. It's a third party that will take your code and it will execute your code. And what it's really solving is a coordination problem. You know, it's helping everyone here coordinate around a single piece of code. And a smart contract gives you the following promises. You know, first, it should never modify or change your code. You know, once I deploy the smart contract, it becomes autonomous and the code never gets changed. Two, if I execute a function in the smart contract, it should always run the code that I tell it. So if I call a vote function, it should always call the vote function. Now importantly, and this is really important when you consider smart contract security, code execution never stops halfway through. You call the vote function and it either completes or it reverts and you lose your money on the gas fees. Uh, so you gotta make sure when you write your code, you can get a guarantee that the function will always complete. And finally, hopefully it's not a secret here, but everything's public in this network. A smart, li smart contract likes to gossip. If you put your date of birth on the blockchain in a smart contract, then everyone can see your date of birth. And you know, the way to think about it as well is on Ethereum, you have accounts and you have transactions. On Ethereum, we have externally owned accounts. That's sort of your MetaMask, your Ethereum address. You can sign transactions. And you have contract accounts. And a contract account basically looks exactly the same, except there's some storage and some code. And so when you're in the EVM and you're running smart contracts, it's very difficult to distinguish if you're talking to another smart contract or to an end user. And there's three types of transactions to consider, and hopefully we'll cover all three in this Solidity tutorial. So one transaction is you can just send money to your friend. Two, you could deploy a smart contract to the platform where you take the bytecode and you literally send it to the network and to the blockchain. And three, an invocation transaction. So if I want to call a function in a smart contract, that's the type of transaction that I would use. In the transaction, I would say, call the vote function off the smart contract. And so, maybe get to this bit first. When you're sending transactions, what's really important is that a smart contract is event-driven. It's not like a normal program. It won't do anything in the background whatsoever. You know, there's no background task. It's basically, it will only execute if you poke it and force it to do something. So in this example, we have a creation transaction. Alice is deploying a smart contract, and the bytecode is in the data field. You deploy that to the blockchain, it gets confirmed, and then the code is instantiated in the database. And then blocks keep getting produced every 12 seconds. And then in block four, Bob comes along. Maybe Bob wants to cast a vote. So Bob will sign a transaction, send it to the network, it gets in the blockchain, and then it will execute the smart contract and update the database. But importantly, and I highlight this now, between block two to three, the smart contract isn't doing anything. It's just sitting in the database, and it's, you know, it's just a bit boring actually, it's just sitting there doing nothing. So that's the right, so the mental model of the hub is, when you create the smart contract, you have to consider, you know, if you need to do something by a certain time, then you need to sign a transaction after that time period. And the last thing to consider is gas. So has anyone here ever paid like $400 on, a gas, on gas fees before? Look at this, we got the DJ and we got the apes. You know, but it's ridiculous, the gas fee is ridiculous. Um, a bit better now actually, um, since the bear market. But anyway, 
So the whole point of gas is a way to prevent spam on the network. So as you're all aware, you know, Ethereum doesn't really scale. And the reason for that is if you allow too many transactions, the database will just keep getting bigger and bigger. And as the database gets bigger, it becomes unmanageable. And so what we do is we rate limit the number of transactions on the network to really constrain how big that database can get. And we use gas for that. Gas is a standard metric. In the, so you have the Ethereum virtual machine. And in the EVM, there's opcodes like add, subtract, store, read. And every opcode has a fixed gas cost. And so just to provide an example, I have this little illustration. So when you send a transaction, you have a gas limit. Let's say it's 80, 80 gas in your transaction. So you're willing to pay up to, you know, you're willing to pay 80 gas worth of you know, work for this transaction. So as we run through the transaction, let's say we use the timestamp time, uh, time opcode, we'll use 10 gas. If you get the block cost for block 500, that's 50 gas. And you can see as we're executing the smart contract, the gas usage is going up. We add a number, that's five gas, and then maybe we get the Coinbase transaction, which is basically the block reward. But if we try to execute that opcode, that, that's about 50 gas worth of you know, execution. And so we exceed the gas limit. And so if you exceed the gas limit, what should happen is you know, it reverts. It's as if the transaction was never executed, but you have to pay for that as well. So when you have a reverted transaction, it's because you got so far through the computation, you run out of gas. It's like you know, driving to a city. You drive through the city, you run out of gas, you get stuck, and you just stop in the middle of nowhere. In this case, you'll end up going back to the home city as if you never took the, you know, never actually tried to drive. So, and by the way, if you have any questions whatsoever, just raise your hand. You know, it's more of a workshop. I just don't want to talk to people for the next half an hour. So this is a high level overview anyway of what a smart contract is, how gas works, and a rough idea of the transactions. Is there any questions at this part before I continue? You're all, all awesome. You're all sort of happy then. Awesome. So let's get into the solidity because that's, that's the fun bit, isn't it? So today we're all going to learn Solidity, and hopefully in the future you'll take this class, go deploy a smart contract, and you may lose millions of dollars. But that's great, you know, that's half the fun of our field. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to use Remix, so this, this website, remix.ethereum.org, and you can follow along with this tutorial. So you can, you know, and what we're going to build is a censorship-resistant hello world because clearly that's what we want censorship resistance for, is the broadcast messages on the blockchain. So I can see someone getting their laptop out, so I'll give you a second. And as a tip, because I just discovered this, at the very bottom here, maybe I have to zoom out a bit, in the settings, you can scroll down and change your theme. I picked the candy one because it was really cute. But you can have a dark theme, light theme, hacker owl theme, whatever your heart desires. So anyway, so let's get started. So if you click the first tab at the top left, this is your, uh, oh, by the way, Remix is an IDE for writing smart contracts in Solidity. You will have a local virtual machine, so you can deploy smart contracts and execute transactions. So you can toy around with some ideas that you want to build. And it's a really good way to learn because you don't have to install any software. And what you'll find here is the file explorer. So I've created a new file called Hello World. You can click this icon up here, I believe, one of these ones, or maybe this one, and you can create a new one. So hello world 2.sol. So just create a new file with a little icon, or you can delete one of the previous files as well. And this is a ballot program, so if you want to go over this in your spare time, you can look at how you, know, you can cast a vote in a smart contract. But for now, we'll just take hello world. So the most important thing that before you get started at the top line, we have a pragma. Pragma solidity 0 0.7 to 0.9. What we're really just saying here is that this smart contract can only be compiled with this version of solidity. And that's quite important because solidity gets updated quite a lot. My old contract from 2016 no longer compile and they can no longer be deployed to Ethereum. So make sure you pick the, a good compiler and a, a good latest compiler. So let's get started. So we're going to first define a smart contract. So the keyword is contract, and we'll name it hello world, 
with curly brackets. Now, the first, the first thing you would want to do with a Hello World program is, you know, accept a message and tell the world, you know, the message was this hello. So let's create a function. We're going to create a function called message, and it's going to take as input a string with a message, maybe MSG, not the salt, just the normal MSG, public, then curly brackets. So the important bit here to highlight is that it looks a bit like JavaScript or Java. You have a function. At the end, you have to declare that this function is public. Public means that anyone in the world can view this function and try to invoke it. If you don't have public, then that defaults to internal. So there's no public, then nobody can call this function. It's internal to the smart contract. And that was because of a lot of interesting bugs in the past where someone would write an admin function but forget to put the word internal. And then anyone could call it. Uh, so anyway, we have function, message, and the memory keyword there, memory pretty much means that this array will be local to this function. It's not long-term storage, it's not in the stack, it's local memory that will be used for this function and then get discarded afterwards. Uh, and bytes is a wrapper, so bytes is basically a bytes32 array, and there's a wrapper around that, so it just looks a very nice way to write strings. Anyway, let's tell the world about a message. But how do we do that? You know, so there's a special keyword in Solidity called event, and this is going to be called echo. And this will take a string with a message. Now, the point of an event is that we have a smart contract that's running on a global network. Sometimes the smart contract wants to notify people that something interesting happened. So if I have a front end, let's just say it's Uniswap, I perform a swap on the, on the website, I want to be notified when my swap happens. So an event is just a way to notify the external world that something interesting happened in this smart contract. And so we'll use an event for that. And then in the, the function message, we're going to emit another keyword, echo with the message that was, uh, you know, inputted by the function. So maybe let's reword this. Let's call this uh, my message. This was different. Okay. So this is the very first basic smart contract. And now what I'm going to do is deploy this to my local virtual machine, then hopefully send a transaction, and of course do the first censorship-resistant hello world. So first we go, woo, censorship resistance, yay. Um, so we go to this middle tab and we want to compile the code. So you have to scroll up, we pick this compiler, just pick the default, and it compile hello world. I always recommend doing that even though there's an auto compile, because I've had some problems in the past where I was just interacting with some old contract for too long. It certainly helps with debugging. Then the tab underneath this is called Deploy and Run Transactions. Uh, I think that's there by default. And if it's not, you can go to this Plugin tab and you can find it. It'll be around here somewhere. But I'm pretty sure it's there by default. So we're going to pick the environment, which is Remix, the virtual machine. But you can connect this to your MetaMask, for example, or to your local test suites. You can use Ganache locally and connect it to your local blockchains. But we're just going to use the virtual machine in the remix. We have a list of accounts. So by default, you get about 10, 15 accounts that you can send transactions from. There's a gas limit. We'll just pick 30 million because we don't want to worry about gas. And we can send value in this transaction as well. So let's deploy the code. We hit the word deploy. Then down here, you will see that that was deployed my contract now exists on my local virtual machine. So if I just close this for a second, if I scroll down here to the very bottom, so again, this tab, we scroll down to the bottom, and you'll see that my contract was deployed. OK, and there's only one function that says message. So I'm going to write a message to say, hello world, the merge is here. Because I used to say the merge is coming, but now the merge is actually here. So let's send that transaction. It will be sent from the account that I have you know, listed here. You can see I've already been deducted ETH. 
So I have pairs of gas. And then if I bring this up, this is the terminal slash the console, you can see that the transaction was successful. I've got a big green ticket, a bit like a gold star. Now if I click this and scroll down, what you'll see is you will see a log. And in the log, you'll see that this was from my address. There was an event called echo. And then there's hello world, the merge is here. So what's important is that when you're writing your front end and you're interacting with the blockchain, when your local node software processes this transaction, it will create a receipt, a post-transaction receipt. And in the receipt, you can find the events. So you can you know, take the transaction, execute it, get the receipt, and then see what events happened inside that transaction. And that's how you would then take that event and, of course, apply it to your website. And I think there's a JSON RPC called ETH get logs, and this is basically what it should be fetching. And you can then obviously search by event and what you're interested in. But you can see we did hello world, the merge is here. So that's awesome. We've now deployed a real censorship resistant smart contract. But it's a bit boring. It can only, you know, uh, say the word hello. Can we make it slightly more interesting? So first let's delete that copy there, just for reference. So what if, could we store the messages? You know, let's just say lots of people are interacting with the smart contract. Can we record the, the messages in order? So anyone can look at historical messages quite easily. So for that, we need an array. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a string, make that an array, and we're going to call this old messages. Okay, no compile errors, that's great. And then down here, we're going to do old messages.push, and we'll just push the, you know, the, the message to the array. Now this is a dynamic array, so you know, I can keep pushing items and the array will keep getting bigger. What I should add is the word public keyword here. The point of the keyword is to make it easy for anyone to access this array. If this is internal, or you know, it's just nothing is written there, there's no, no you don't declare it as public, then technically speaking, the data is public and the data is in the database, but it's not indexed. It's not easily accessible using common tooling but you could eventually access it if you tried it hard enough. If you make it public, then it's really easy for anyone to access. You know, they can look at your smart contract, look at the database, and look up the array. So we just make that public. So now let's try this. Let's uh, record some old messages to the blockchain. So again, we go that we compile it. We will deploy it. And then we'll scroll down and we'll see the contract exists. And we should see two functions now. There's an old message, and there's, of course, the, the transaction. So depending on your, your color theme, in my case, yellow means that this is a transaction that will, you know, that can potentially modify the state of the smart contract. The blue icon is a read function or a view function. So I can only view information of this, and it won't actually be a transaction. You know, viewing something means looking up the local database. I don't have to send a transaction to read information about a smart contract. So let's store messages again, the merge is here. We'll send this to the network, and of course, it should hopefully be successful. Again, it's successful. So how do we look up the old message? So again, this is an array. So what you would expect to happen is I put in the message at number zero, and it should pop up, the merge is here. Now what if I say, the merge is amazing, proof of work is gone forever. Yeah, I can send this message, and again, it should be successful, and we have that stored in the array. So as you can see, the number zero will still return me the merge is here. And if I add the number one, it gives me my new message, the merge is amazing, POW is gone forever, yeah, you know, really exciting, I'm really happy with that. But what happens if I put the number two? What do you guys think happens? You know, hands up if you think it returns the number zero. Or a number, okay, hands up if you think it's going to throw an exception. Oh, look at this, look at this, oh. You're right, it throws an exception, which is quite nice. You know, if I try to view that, it'll complain here and it revert it. So that's good behavior, you know, if you look up an array, thankfully it's going to return, you know, zero or an exception. 
Cool. So let's make this a bit more interesting because right now it's a pretty boring smart contract. So what, let's add an admin to it. You know, let's actually add someone who has admin privileges to the smart contract. Okay, so uh, we're going to have, this is called an address. So there's a special keyword called address, which is basically an Ethereum account, you know, those weird squiggly letters and numbers. Now importantly, as I mentioned before, a smart contract cannot distinguish if it's interacting with an externally owned account that has a public private key, or if it's interacting with another smart contract. All it will receive is an address. You have to do special tricks to do that distinction. But anyway, let's call this admin, and we just you know, have it there. But the problem is, is that this is gonna be instantiated to the zeros. You know, we haven't actually put an admin address in there. So what we're going to do is, the user who deploys this smart contract will become the admin. So we'll do constructor, and then we'll set the admin to message.sender. Now, message.sender is another keyword. A message.sender basically means who is the immediate caller of this smart contract? It is not the transaction signer, whichever is the immediate caller. So that could be the user who signed the transaction, or it could be another smart contract. So a smart contract can deploy another smart contract, and a smart contract can interact with another smart contract. A message.sender is the immediate caller. If you want the transaction signer, it's transaction.origin, so it would be this. But you never, ever, ever, ever use this. Never use transaction.origin. If you ever use it, you did not take this class. Okay, you never use it, you know, it's, unless you're, it should really be called transact, it should really be called gas pair, who paid the gas of this transaction. But so many contracts have been broken because people use transaction.origin instead of message.sender. The problem is that there's a man in the middle attack or a contract in the middle attack. Where if you, you know, interact with a, I don't know, a malicious airdrop smart contract because you're going to get rich and get a Lambo, actually that then talks to your Gnosis safe and steals all of your funds. So never use transaction.origin. Always use message.sender unless you know what you're doing. And even then, still use message.sender. Okay, so now what should happen is that when I deploy this smart contract, I will be set as the admin. But the admin isn't doing anything here. Oh, I should make that public, by the way, to make it easy for us all to know I'm the admin. So what would an admin do in this case? And what would be a useful function for an admin? Well, maybe only the admin could, uh, you know, write a message to the smart contract. So how would we do that? Well, we can create a, something called a modifier. And in this case, we're going to check if, uh, if message.sender equal equal the admin. If not, only the admin can call this function. And we will add that modifier. Oh, I forgot to give it a name. So let's call it only owner. This is quite a popular one and we will add it on top of the message. And of course, we do this weird squiggly thing. Let me explain what I just did there. Okay, so if you look at the function message, I've added this keyword, or not keyword, this, you know, this thing called only owner. Only owner is a modifier that I defined up here. And a modifier is really just, you know, it takes your function and it will pre-append code. So when you call the message function, it will execute this first, and then move into your function. It's really useful when you wanna you know, repeat the same code multiple times. So if you have you know, 10 functions that can only be called by the admin, well, you would create a modifier for that. Because then it's really easy to see that only the admin can call this, and only this function can be called by the admin. Now, the other keyword I used was require. And I guess require is not really a scary word anymore. It's basically a precondition check. You're just checking, is this, is the immediate caller of this smart contract, are they the admin? If the immediate caller is the admin, then let them call the message function. Otherwise, throw out this error message. And of course, this really, really weird keyword, and I don't understand this, like why would you have an underscore and a semicolon? 
This never made any sense to me whatsoever. You would think if, you know, you had this modifier, you'd run this code, move on to the function, and, you know, continue on with the code. But here you have to define this. You have to say, this is the end of the modifier, and you can now continue to the function. Why the Solidity gods have done this, I don't know. But never, you know, you'll, always, you'll get an error message if you don't do it. But anyway, we've created a constructor, we've created a modifier, and we added the access rights onto this function. So only the admin can call this function. So let's try it. Let me get rid of these files. We don't, we don't care about evoting today. So again, we're going to compile it, and we're going to deploy it. Just double check, delete old smart contracts, and we deploy this. And hopefully, it was deployed well, that's good, there's no error messages, and we can see there's some more functions here. Well, actually, yeah, we can see who the admin is. That's the address of the admin, and that should be me up here. Now, as the admin, I'm going to send a transaction again to say the merge is here. Yeah, thanks, Vitalik. What a bro. And we're going to send that to the network. And of course, the transaction was successful. You can see that it did emit the event. Oh, down here. You know, uh, the merge is here. Yeah, thanks, Vitalik. You know, he controls the master node, so it's really useful. Um, and now by typing the O message here, I can see that the message was stored. But what happens if I send it from another address? So I scroll up here. The first account in that list was the admin. Let's pick the second address. So we click this. We'll scroll down and say, ha ha, I am a Bitcoin Mexi. You know, let's just send that off. Now, thankfully, the Ethereum people can detect this. They're not the admin, and it gets thrown. You know, we, we just discard this message. And of course, the message was never stored, so I can't look it up either. That will also revert. So that's cool. The admin feature worked. You know, we did access control with the modifier, and we were able to send transactions. But what's really annoying here is that we only have one admin. You know, what's the point of sending a smart contract where only one user can interact with it? You might as well have a centralized database for that. So what if we could add multiple admins? You know, how, how would we do that? Well, what we should use is a mapping. So we can have a mapping from, a, from address to Boolean, and now we have a mapping of admins. And if I scroll down here, I just have to modify this slightly. That will be true. And up here, we will look up the mapping for an admin. OK, so let me explain what I did there. Oh, I have an error. Look at this. Oh, <laughs> that's really funny. I did it the wrong way around. Message.sender. Cool. So let's go over what I just did there. So I've added this new uh, mapping. And a mapping, you know, it's a uh, very typical, you know, you're going from a you know, item A to item B, which is a clear mapping, key to values. So we have a mapping of addresses, and that will be linked to a Boolean. So if I look up the admin address, it should hopefully return true. If I look up another address, it should return false. Okay? Now down here, I've set it to true. So when I deploy the smart contract, I get the address of the sender, and I set this to true to say that whoever created this smart contract is set as the admin. And then when I call the message function, we will of course go to only owner, and in only owner, you'll look up the admin mapping, you'll put in message.sender, and it should hopefully return true. If it returns true, then everything is fine. So again, we compile this, and we send it, or we deploy it. We deploy the smart contract. And then down here, again, we have the function. So if I do Hello world, I send that message to the smart contract, and um, that worked fine. If I look up the admin, oh, what I have to do now actually, because it's a mapping, I have to look up my address. So I take my address, which is the second account, I believe, and I'll put this in. Oops. If I do admin, it returns true. Now, if I put in a different address, you know, uh, what do you guys think this is going to do? Do you think it will return false because I haven't defined it, or do you think it will revert? So raise your hand if you think it's false. 
Um, raise your hand if you think it reverts. Well, that's awesome. Good, good. So it does return false. Um, and that's really important. So if you remember, is, that, is anyone familiar with the Nomad Bridge hack? Okay. Well, basically, the problem was that they had a weird, I think it was actually an array list, but it was basically like a mapping. They, they thought it would revert, and it returned true. You know, it, it returned the, the zero address, and that's how they got hacked. So this very subtle, weird behavior between arrays and mappings was one of the reasons why they fell victim to a hack. So again, you got to be very careful what you're doing here. Even the basics of an array is very, very, very important. So if I put in the number zero, I should find hello world. Now, the other issue with this smart contract is again, I only have one admin. So now I want to install admins. Okay, so what I do is I go down here, function, install admin, and maybe I want to have, you know, a new admin. And only the owner should really be able to call this, or maybe we should call that now. Maybe this should be only admins. Because really it's a mapping, so it shouldn't be owner anymore. And here, if we get through this, then we do uh, admin, new admin, equal true. Okay? So very clearly, we have an install admin function. It can only be called by admins. And we can, of course, uh, you know, do equal true. So let's deploy this. Let's compile it. Oh, that's the script. Whoops. Let's compile it. Uh, yep. Let's get rid of that. Whoops, whoops. And we're going to deploy that smart contract. It gets deployed fine. And now, of course, we're going to install an admin. So the first address is the admin. So I'll get the address of the second one. I'll call this through. Oops, that's you. Oh, haha, do you see what I did here? Even I made a mistake. Oh, wow. I forgot to put the public keyword. Oh, no, I did put the public keyword. Where is it then? Oh, good. Oh, good. oh, you know what? I have two. This is a good debugging example. I forgot to delete the old smart contract here. So actually, let me just delete all of this and just redeploy it. Yeah, that normally happens to me. I end up interacting with old code by mistake. So we deploy it. And now we can see there's an install admin function. So let's go here, copy the address, and we just install it. Bam. Hopefully that returns true. Ah, only the, oh, <laughs> only the admin can call this because I'm sending it from the person who wants to become the admin. So I need to go back to the admin account and, of course, install admin. And that's now successful. And now if I go back, the admin could just install themselves as an admin. So technically it works, doesn't do anything, but it works. So now we've got through some of the basics. So the most important thing of a smart contract is money. You know, a lot of these applications are financial in nature. So how do we handle ETH? You know, how do I receive money in this smart contract? So maybe what we do is, you know, we keep the admins, but maybe we only allow people to submit a message if they give some money towards it. So let's do modifier on payment, and we require that the message that value equal equal is a one ether. Yeah, let's do that. I think that works. You must pay one ether. I'll send back to. Oh, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> okay, now that's clearly complaining because, uh, oh, I forgot about this weird Solidity God underscore thingy. And now what we're going to do is also have another function because that can be called by the admins. Uh, you know, pay to message. And this will be on payment. So now it's the exact same function. So let's walk through this again, okay? So what's it complaining about? Uh, this modifier uses message.value. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So that's a new solidity feature. So basically, there's this new keyword duh, 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 called payable. Yes, awesome. So what used to happen in the past was that people would send money to smart contracts that weren't able to handle it, and then the money gets stuck forever. So you've got to declare a payable keyword on the function in order to receive money when this function is called. And we'll, we'll walk through that now with an example. So let's, you know, again, compile this. Bam, bam. And we're going to deploy it. 
cool. So let's get the first address. We deploy this wonderful smart contract. And now we're down here. So we have this love, oh, look at that lovely red icon, like a good warning. You're sending money to this function. So let's do hello world, and we won't send any money. And of course, it should fail. You must pay one ether uh, to you know, the, the send this transaction. So we have to send one ether. This is, oh, okay, good, thank God, because <laughs> ether is a lot of zeros. So we're going to send one ether. So in, at the top of the screen here, you just see a value field, and you can select ether there, and we'll send one ether in this, mark, in this transaction. Okay, so we're going to pay to message. Hopefully that worked. It did. Awesome. If I scroll down here, we then have hello world. And of course, I could look up this old message. Awesome. So we've done very well so far. But one issue with this smart contract, and hopefully someone's noticed by now, I can send one ether to the smart contract, but I can't take any money out. So really, I'm burning the money. You know, every time I send a message, I have to send one Ether, pay $2,000. Oh, I don't know what the price is now, $1,500. And of course, uh, the money gets stuck forever. So now we have to consider, you know, how do we withdraw money from this smart contract? Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is have a function with withdraw. And this can only be called by an admin. And this is public, and I believe it's going to force me to do payable. So I'm going to do payable in there. Now, what I want to do is send the money to uh, the caller of the smart contract. So I believe it's... I've not done this for a while, actually. Let me see. So I want to transfer address this dot balance. Does it complain? Okay, I see the issue. Um. See, they made this really awkward now, haven't they? So let's do this. Okay, so address, payable, receiver, equal address. Yes. And then we're going to get the balance, which is uint, bal, equal address, this, dot balance. Well, that should be uh, uint. And then here we're going to transfer bal. Oh, wow, that's what I'm doing wrong. One sec. Of course you're complaining. Look at this. What wonderful debugging, isn't it? So objects. Let's try this. Mm. What about this? Withdraw. I forget how to do it with message as sender, so let's just do this. See, this is how you do real Solidity programming. Da -da. Oh, you wrap it, of course. Oh, I hit the payable keyword and it drives me crazy. Okay. So there you go. That's good debugging. So this is do this. This is address payable receiver, just to make it clear and I can explain it. And then here we're going to have receiver. Dot file. Awesome. Okay, so let's walk through this code then and see what happens. Now, this is a long way to write it. Normally, you would shorten the code. So here, this is a withdrawal function. And again, we have to declare this as payable because we're going to deal with Ether in the smart contract. Now, what we're doing is getting the address. Maybe I don't even need address. I don't, maybe I shouldn't have to wrap that. Let's see. Good. Okay. So I'm getting the address of the immediate caller of the smart. Oh, five minutes. Perfect. I'm getting the address of the immediate caller, which again could be a MetaMask user or it could be a smart contract on Ethereum. And I'm wrapping this around a payable so I can say that this address can receive money by the smart contract. And I'm defining it here just because it's easy to read. What you have to do is define the address with the payable keyword to say that this receiver can receive money. Now I'm grabbing the current balance from the smart contract. So address this will allow you to interact with, with yourself. And here I'm getting the balance of this address. And in the end, I'm doing receiver.transfer, and I'm transferring this balance to the receiver. 
And so hopefully, this will work. So let's see. So if I'm going to compile the code, I'm going to uh, deploy the smart contract from the first address. Let's delete this. Down here. Boom. Now I am the admin, so let's go to a normal user and let's send one ether, because that's what was required. We're going to do hello world. I want to withdraw that. Hopefully successful. There you go. I got one ether and you know it sent the message. And I'm going to do uh, just check if the message is there. Awesome. So now I'm going to change to the admin account. And I'm going to withdraw the funds. So uh, is there an e Oh, yeah. So the balance of the smart contract is currently one Ether. So if I withdraw this, then hopefully the money will be withdrawn. So I do withdraw. It was successful. And the zero ETH is now taken away from that smart contract. Although maybe I shouldn't have shown it before, but you know, this now has one extra ETH. And that's basically how you deal with money in the smart contract. And just before I finish, in the most Ethereum way possible, if I jump down here, let's how do I get rid of this? Let's get rid of this. One homework exercise is uh, that transfer is no longer a safe function to use. So there's dot send transfer and dot send. The homework exercise is, let me write it here. What does you know, receiver dot send transfer about? Let's have both of these examples. What does it return? Why is it not safe? So this is a homework exercise, and the reason I bring it up is for two reasons. One, when you're interacting with another smart contract, so when you send money to another smart contract, what you're actually doing is you're jumping to this smart contract, and you're going to execute code. They have a receive function or a fallback function. Now, if that fails for whatever reason, you know, I send money to here, it fails and reverts. Does transfer revert or does it return false? And again, in that send, does that revert or return false? So I'm not going to give the answer. Someone there knows it. You know, someone's clearly uh, on this. So that's the first one. You should always be careful what a function returns. If it's going to fail for whatever reason, you have to catch the failure and do something about it. This was basically one of the reasons why several smart contracts have lost funds because uh, they didn't check whether this failed or not. And it led to something called a re-entrancy attack. And you can look up the DAO, look up re-entrancy, and see why it says a bad problem. The second thing to highlight is that dot .transfer and dot .send were introduced to stop re-entrancy attacks. But in the most Ethereum way possible, there was an upgrade about two years ago that basically defeated the, the, the safeguard here. And now they're also still vulnerable to a re-entrancy attack. So you should look up on Google how to do dot .call, and you send the money that way. You don't actually use transfer or send anymore. But it's good for teaching because it's easy. So let's summarize. So we've built this very basic Hello World smart contract. When we deploy the smart contract, the immediate caller is set as the owner. And the admin can install as many admins as they want. And we do that using a mapping. And we can look up an address, and we can check if the admin is installed or not. Now, every time we send a message to the smart contract, you can either pay one Ether to do it, or you're an admin, and you get to send a message for free. Now, what we're going to do is store those old messages in an array. So it's historically available in the database for an easy lookup. I can look up the message, 50, you know, the 50th message that was sent. Now, the way we have this access control here is because of the modifiers. We have an only admin modifier, and we check if the admin was installed, or we handle payments. You know, on payment, did I receive one ether from the caller? You know, what, a user has sent one ether to the smart contract, and if you've sent me one ether, then you can send a message. We have this weird underscore semicolon. Again, the solidity gods have defined that. No one, I do not understand why. In the pay to message, we have special keyword for payable. So if you're dealing with money in any form, in any, sorry, if you're dealing with ETH transfers, you have to put payable here. 
And of course, you have to do it here as well when you're going to withdraw the funds. And you have to say this address can receive funds as well. And if you look in the ERC20 tokens, this has nothing to do with ERC20 tokens because an ERC20 token is another smart contract. It only deals with Ether, which is the native currency of the network. And finally, we covered dot transfer, we covered dot send, and I gave two homework exercises. What does it return, and why are these not safe? It's always worth looking that up because it will hopefully prevent you losing millions of dollars. So uh, I guess it's the end of the workshop, so thank you very much for listening, guys. I hope it covered the basics of Solidity, and you have a, a bit more of an idea now. Are there any questions? I mean, oh yeah, cheers. Thank you. Awesome.